Okay, I am yeah. absolutely delighted to have the incredible wisdom of uh, Dr. Robert Sands here. Uh, Robert Sands, hello, Bob. Um, hello. You are a, a man of great experience and, wow, such a, a, a distinguished life of living your passion by the looks of it. You are a, a, a medical doctor, you went to medical school and then you uh, went into the army. You were a, a battalion commander, is that right? For a little while, Fantastic. mostly a, an army doctor. Army doctor, and you you uh, were seeing, um, I imagine, soldiers and all kinds of people uh, for psychiatry and psychological wellness. Correct. Yeah. And then you really moved into what seems to be your really big passion, which was you trained in child and adolescent um, psychiatry. And you are a board certified child and adolescent psychiatrist. Yes. And you are board certified separately as an adult uh, psychiatrist too. Yes. It just gets better and better, doesn't it? And then you, yeah. you, you uh, talk that passion you have for psychiatry. Um, you were also a surgeon at one point, weren't you, in the army, which is absolutely astounding. You did well, that's a misnomer because every doctor is a physician and surgeon. So I'm a licensed physician and surgeon, but I don't do surgery. So oh. it's, just, it's just a name. Still, it's still an impressive one. <laughs> and, you, and you still did the work to get the qualifications, so all good. And, and then you, you moved into to private practice, didn't you? And um, are practicing even today. Uh, it's, it's been decades that you've been um, really kind of energizing your passion for psychiatry, especially in children and adults. And I was uh, it's lovely to see that you are a distinguished member of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. Yes, that's true. And you are also when you, the when president. When you get old, you get these accolades. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I also, I love this one. You are uh, the president of your regional association, which is, uh, which is great. And also you are, you, you still practice, um, uh, you know, uh, what do I say, mainstream psychiatry, not just the kind of uh, ch child and adolescent, and you've worked with schools and individuals, and even in, in my, my uh, field of work, um, helping people to understand the psychiatry of why certain things happen in the workplace. And, um, and here you are, come to share your lovely knowledge. Um, let me just say for people who are watching this, I've had some mind-blowing conversations with Robert Sands and um, people who know me know I'm coming from a hippie kind of idealistic utopian thing how everything can be so beautiful in the world if only people did A, B, C and D and then I spoke to Robert once or twice and uh, what he told me and what he, his experience uh, really ignited in me. I just thought we have to have this uh, gentleman along to really share. So let's dive into it. And I'm going to say that I, I when when my spiritual kindness came came you know came blooming and emerging within me in my late teens, I came across a, a, a mantra or a, a, a maxim, a, a saying, a phrase that I really held very close to my heart for many, many, many years. And that phrase was, love conquers all. It was, the, you know, the amor of inchit omnia. And, and, and I, I, I naively, I was reading all these spiritual books and I was all kind of, yay, you know, the, the world can be a utopian dream if we just <laughs> love each other. That's all it takes, you know, love and acceptance and tolerance. And I learned, obviously, as I grew older, that it, it didn't actually, it didn't conquer all. And sometimes when you cared for people and were kind to people, they just saw it as a weakness and something to take advantage of. So what I'd like to ask you, Bob, is, um, uh, is kind of, I'm going to put a few layers on it. I'm going to start off saying, does love conquer all? And is love enough? And 
what are the limits of love in your experience regarding young people, children, adolescents, how it affects the adult? And can you love someone into wellness if they've experienced trauma and, and um, you know, attachment or detachment issues? Wow, it covers a lot and it's very relevant to my experience, which actually shared your point of view, I would say early in my training, we were taught and brought into a way of believing that if you uh, stuck by somebody and loved them in the proper way, that would heal. And some, I would say sometimes it does. So the answer is sometimes. Sometimes love is enough and uh, love, sometimes love conquers, <coughs> excuse me, um, but frequently not. And so we have to unpack it and put it into groups. Uh, one lesson I learned and psychiatry or psychotherapy, let's say, if you're, if you're working with someone and you are loving, loving them in the right way, you have their interest in mind and everything you do is about promoting their interest, which requires a thoughtful framework. Let's face it, it's not just whatever you want, dear. That's a kind of a child meme that the, we're raising children by believing that giving children whatever they want is love. And one phrase is that love are boundaries, that by creating a container wow. for civilization or for a family, that's love, not, okay. uh, not indulgence, not just that's the good. sentiment, not just the feeling. Mm -hmm. So in working with uh, teenagers, you find they they do have this idealistic love. I think we all did if you're capable of it. Not everybody's capable of it. That's a separate point. Yeah. But most healthy kids. Nope. Heal, they move on and they move from attachment love. You might say simple infatuation love or attachment love to a more mature kind of love mm. where you see love is not enough is trying to heal profound damage or genetic damage or something overwhelming if you believe that just uh, hanging in there for example hanging in there will transform someone that's proven wrong over and over again although maybe one out of a hundred it works and yeah, so absolutely. it kind of it's very seductive you kind of think well with kids for example if you hang in there with them really difficult kids they really could suck the life out of you because they're so defiant and uncooperative and if you hang in there i have seen and i've marveled at this because i've thought would i would i hang in there with this kid who's tearing the family apart uh, with their behavior. And usually it's the mother, not always. The women seem to be more endowed with this capacity to love to the point of suffering. Wow. Sometimes we call that uh, parental masochism, that parents, it's not just women, but parents will will suffer through their children. And then lo and behold, they grow up and they're like actual people. Wow. And, and then you, and you try and discuss when you were little, you were just horrible. They say, I don't know what you're talking about. They have no memory of this and wow. because they're, they're in their own bubble. So the answer is love is sometimes enough. Frequently it's not love really needs to be discussed there's books out about the five languages of love mm. there's the famous book love is not enough which is about treating autism mm. with personal relationship well you can't and this was tried in a variety of settings over many years where you try and love autistic children into relationship and they're in their own world and it just didn't work. And there were some pretty dramatic interventions used institutionally to try and 
cause the child to feel love. It's like, can you love? Can you love someone by squeezing them, you know, mm -hmm. or in, in engulfing them? So there's engulfing love and there's, you know, you can go, we could talk for hours about the different types of love mm -hmm. and uh, ignore the people who can't love. That would probably be a dividing line. You know, there are people who can love and then there are people who apparently, you know, it's hard to judge a person's character, but apparently they they can't love or the way they love is is so different it's like a different conversation okay so so the things that i pick up from there is that i love what you said that love is boundaries that is like <laughs> that is not something that you often hear people say and it's so you know when you said it it's just like oh yes yes absolutely and and i do think certain personality types do think you can just just you know if I, like you say about about parental masochism I mean you you always think that surely if they know that they're safe and secure and everything is okay and you know you know I'm always here that it's going to be okay and what you what you just said about autism um because as as we know autism is really on the rise and you were saying something about autism uh, relating to environmental toxicity in a way um, or environmental toxins or um and how um people with autism it's interesting that you get to a point there must be a point a parent gets to where they think this isn't all, uh, normal. This isn't normal. This is not my expectations. How a child would love me, or if this I, child would love the the pet, yeah. or this <laughs> child would love its sibling, and and does and is that is that something that is just okay? The the parents start thinking there's there's something amiss here. There's something, that, and obviously the I, I realize the autistic spectrum is massive, um, and but. Tell me a bit more about that, how, how it comes to pass that, that this noticing that, that, that these kids can't kind of understand love or give love or, or am I misunderstanding that? Well, I mean, it's, it's bigger than, than, than love, really. It's, it, you might call it a developmental disorder or skip disorder. Let's say a delay, a developmental delay. So you don't see a normal things emerging from your child you're watching them and you oh language or they seem self-preoccupied or they don't relate to others and so that isn't all autism but that's the the reality is that we bring hope and love and expectation to our children and then they disappoint us and they become who they are and we have to adjust to who they are by accepting them which is loving i mean love is what acceptance mm -hmm. but it's not all it's just like kids need love but they also need boundaries and they need no uh, probably more often than they need yes but there's you know there's room for for all of this mm -hmm. the, the difficulty of the parent is that they become frightened when they see their child not developing normally mm -hmm. and then they go and get a consult from the pediatrician who says, oh, your child has developmental delays or or they're, let's say they're overly, we could, we could create a list of problems mm -hmm. that children have that concern mm -hmm. parents. Mm -hmm. And some of those uh, they grow out of, that's the old phrase, they'll grow out of it. And that's do they? true that kids- Do, do, do they grow out they of do, it? They mm do. -hmm. Okay. Some things, some things that they don't grow out of mm. and some things they do. And so as a practitioner, you counsel the parent and say, well, we've got to look at this next year and here's what you need to do. You don't, you got to uh, really uh, deal with them more firmly. You get into parenting types because okay. each kid needs a different style of parenting. The sensitive child, which is actually usually more compliant, they're easy to parent because they're so anxiously looking to you for guidance. They don't want to disappoint. They're very different than the, what's called the externalizing child that just does what they want and they don't, they don't feel bad. The, uh, the mother's guilt tripping has no effect on that child. They, they just do what they want and mm -hmm. what they need are consequences 
that train them rather than relational appeal. Mm -hmm. A healthy, a healthy, normal child knows when they're, they're they do care and they do regulate themselves mm -hmm. when they see hurt or upset in the other. The other mm -hmm. might be a peer, might be a sibling. Mm -hmm. But there are definitely kids that actually are what we call conflict seeking. Mm -hmm. They actually love to create conflict. And you might say, well, why would they do that? Where's their love? Well, mm -hmm. maybe they don't have enough love or maybe they're kind of wired for aggressivity or conflict. They enjoy it. So I, I think you should be getting the picture that there's all sorts of children, there's all sorts of parents. They come together, the child comes, there's disappointment, there's joy. The, the parent has an idea of wanting to meet the need. That's a medical, that, that was a concept that moved me when I heard it, that we want to, what is the need and how can the need be met? Mm. Whose need are and we talking love, about? Love, the love, child's love need or the parent's need, need or whose need? Well, of course, the parents, if the parents are highly masochistic, they don't think about their needs. They just think, oh, child, 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 what do you want to do? What do you want? What do you want to do? Do you, what do you want? Where do you want to go? Mm -hmm. And that's kind of an extreme that isn't terribly helpful. It, it encourages mm -hmm. the child to actually believe that they're the center of the universe. Mm -hmm. And of course, most children do think they're the center of the universe because that's their nature. Their nature is very- Narcissism. Not what we call <laughs> narcissism, right. We all come from primal narcissism. Don't you remember your days of primal narcissism? <laughs> but you know, you grow out of it because you get into a relationship with somebody, you care about them or like a child, a young child with a tender heart will love someone in their class. I mean, that's the beginning mm -hmm. of coming out of narcissism. The way you really come out of narcissism is you fall in love or you have a child, mm -hmm. hopefully as a young adult, but frequently as a teenager, the girls have children. And you can see the most narcissistic, rude girl become an amazing mother that organizes all of her life energy around this child. Wow. It's transformational. It's very transformational and something to see, something to witness. Superb. And then you do also, I believe, get, um, there's two things I want to say. The first one is you do also get, um, I've had clients that would say that their mothers were total narcissists and they end up mothering their own parents even at a young age the, the 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 mother just seems to turn into a needy child and the poor child at a very young age sometimes can just end up you know doing everything for for that mother which uh, i've always wondered how how that um kind of comes to pass that's the first bit of the question and the second one was um listening to um the whole idea of, of children in uh, sort of triggered by what you're saying about autism. Is it, is, do you, do you think it's a, so say it's a, 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 a brain thing or is it just, what is it about sometimes people see, okay, let me just uh, order my thoughts here. So, you know, I've always had this like, you know, again, this utopian thing of, babies are this pure lovely thing with a white with a c completely um white canvas they've a clear slate these pure souls and they're just born and there's just and then and then um some research i've done you you actually and and you know you know i've told you before that i've looked into the history of some serial killers and and if they were kind of a little bit different in their minds and their behaviors when they were young and often they were and it's like, or often something triggered a a, a kind of weird, a, a whole kind of strange thing that did something to the mind. So do you think that there are kids that could be born kind of with a bit of a skewness to them? Or do you believe that all kids are born with this kind of blank canvas? Or what, what's your experiences is with these decades and decades of psychiatry, what have you, what have you noticed? 
decades and decades and decades and decades. So, yes, uh, <laughs> yes, the um, the child uh, demon or the demonic child, which is, you know, we all work through our demons. That's common parlance to say we face our, our dark side demons, but the child who's devoid of a concern for others. You might say in general, the biggest group would be self-centered narcissistic children who persist and don't grow out of that. Mm. And so that would be, but they don't necessarily do evil things and they kind of get it that if they, they work off boundaries. So they're not doing anything because of how they feel or they're, you know, they have any concern for you. They don't want to get in trouble. And if you think about it, most kids don't want to get in trouble. You know, if they're socialized, they don't want to get in trouble. And that's what keeps them on the on the railroad tracks. Like can, I just, can I just kind of jump in there and just tell me and anyone else who's, who's kind of watching, when you say when they're socialized, what, in your um, professional opinion, does that mean? What does it mean to socialize a child? Well, the biggest definition is that they're attached. So a socialized child is one that feels something for another person. It's usually the mother, but frequently both parents. And sometimes it's a sibling, but they, they develop a capacity to feel as a result of that relationship and so the rest of socialization is really parenting and boundaries and consequences that even even heartfelt kids need to know that they need if they do this they're going to get in trouble and that helps them stay so socialization is about shaping behavior that's a, a behavioral a behavior modification principle shaping behavior or guiding but the real uh, source of socialization is the mother and the mother's love. And, the, and this is why mothers are revered, even though there's conflict about that. And, you know, do, you know, whether you love your mother or not. But the mother is really the source of socialization. And without attachment and without that experience that organizes the child around another human being that's very it's a much more difficult path in life mm. and that's called the un unsocialized child mm. has absent or poor personal relationships they don't they don't um they haven't gotten something that's typically assigned to the mother although i i've seen families where the mother is less available or interested and the father is more maternal. You know, we, we, we still assign that function and call it maternal. So mm -hmm. there's the maternal father. Yeah. Yeah. And the might say, well, wait a minute, can't you be paternal and loving? Well, you know, who, who knows, but mm -hmm. it's, it's obvious that most, um, most of the maternal effect in the world comes from women and, but definitely men are uh, capable of loving and they do and they make a huge difference. So it's mm -hmm. not to minimize the effect of men. But this is a this is an early childhood point. Mm -hmm. This is the first three years of life, maybe the first five. Mm -hmm. Then the child's got to move on. And the mm -hmm. mother's uh, uh, gravity, you might say, needs to be uh, weakened so I the child did. can emancipate. Mm -hmm. mm. And um, it tell, it tell you a story that I, I, I had a friend once and, and it was a, a male and he had had the kind of <clears throat> childhood. And I found this really, really interesting. And you must have seen this uh, in your practice all over the years. And he had a, a mother who was um, <clears throat> alcoholic, completely uninterested in being a mother, completely uninterested in her child. He'd come home from school and the, and the house was locked. And there was no note, there was no nothing. And they couldn't get you to sit on the step 
and wait and wait and wait. And obviously his mother's off down the pub drinking and whatever and completely and utterly disinterested. And his coping mechanism for this, which I found quite astounding, was he almost hero worshipped his mother. And, 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 and he, he said he made all these excuses and all this and, and went to see her and did this. And, and I only assumed uh, after a while, I thought, OK, this guy's got a choice. He either hero worships her or has to acknowledge she was a rubbish mother. And she she was just completely and utterly absent. And maybe hero worshipping was much more um, doable for him than just saying my mother was absolutely useless. And and I mean, when you're talking about attachment uh, disorders, I mean, he had a he he, he had a, a, an erratic life. He was a very nice guy, but erratic and just could never settle down. But have you seen that a lot? It's like really bad parenting. The, the, the kids kind of go, oh, no, my, my, my mother or my father was great. And they weren't. They were rubbish. You see it. Yeah. And what's your take on it? So I have. <laughs> well, I could say a lot, but I'll just say a little. Uh, there's a, a book called The Childhood You Never Had which was a, um, a professor, a woman's professor, trying to tell people that you have created a false idea of your childhood. And you might say, well, why would a person do that? Why wouldn't they be realistic? Well, you're, the guy you mentioned probably was more comfortable and less devastated by holding an illusion that is, my, he loved his mother. He was yearning for the mother. We're all born with this genetically endowed need or yearning to love and be loved. I mean, most of us. Mm. And so he created a defensive idealization that was less painful than the blunt reality that his mother uh, was indifferent. Mm. You know, maybe he could rationalize, if only she would stop drinking, then mm. she would love me. And mm. all the kids will jump through hoops. And uh, what's amazing is the outcomes that many uh, kids that have a deprivation background, I would call that a deprivation. Mm. You're deprived mm. of a basic basic sucker or love or nurturance mm. or, or feeling... Um, the apple of somebody's eye, you know, where where you are special, which is a feeling that uh, is best in early childhood. And mm -hmm. frequently it lasts a lifetime that you have memories of being that. He didn't have that. Mm -hmm. And he adapted by creating a, an illusion or yeah, a, yeah. a false belief. Yeah. But it, 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 uh, it was better than the alternative. He might have been totally crushed that's uh, quite common that we will create false ideas even as adults i mean in adult relationships there's love by the way uh, is blind of course we've all heard that and it's blind because it it turns off judgment that would say wait a minute red flag red flag red flag so love really pushes people together who then have to fight it out. You know, that's where they have the power struggle and they find out who they really are. And the love um, hopefully doesn't totally fall away, but the spell, the spell of love decreases and they learn to accept people on human terms mm. that they're not idealized. And do you think, do you think this guy would then take that kind of, um, discombobulated idea of, of mothers and relationships and women, okay, into his relationships. Do, I mean, would he do that? Would he, Can you imagine that kind of, because how can he then yeah. relate to women when the woman that he was, should have been primarily attached to completely rejected him? Would he, do you think he would always expect rejection? Well, he would probably repeat some kind of pattern of involvement with unavailable women, mm. hoping to find love. I mean, this is a major theory or idea that's popular and pretty well accepted that we, we tend to try and find 
love, looking for love in all the wrong places. You know, you've heard, isn't that a song? Looking for love in all the wrong places. Well, why why do people do that? It's because they're not running from a logical, and this is where therapy isn't always at its best. You try and talk somebody out of pursuing mm. a pattern mm. that's self-defeating, mm. where they're uh, picking, picking, their picker is bad, mm. and they keep picking people. And so a part of their education is learning through pain. They say pain is the teacher, right? You've Absolutely. heard this, pain is Absolutely. the teacher. Mm. So, and this is different than a lecture on relationships where the eyes glaze over and the kids, you know, if you're working with adolescents, you're trying to teach them that, that this won't work out. They need to go through that until they finally come out on the other side and have some wisdom, you know, the pain is the teacher and learn to be attracted to. If you're not attracted to somebody who's um, available and interested in you, that's a real problem. I mean, you keep, Absolutely. you're pursuing people that don't, don't care about you. They're, they're, they're deficient in some way. And have you have you noticed that pain with, with the adolescents that you're, you're dealing with, um, does pain actually lead them to the, you know, a, a moment or a, a kind of uh, understanding of, of where they've been does pain actually teach in the end does it bear fruit it does mm. so we've all got to go through well i i meal. hope so because there, there <laughs> there's so much of it you'd hope that but it's it is true that some people are slow learners but most <laughs> of us i always ask pain. kids have you had your heart broken mm. you know and the ones that say what are you talking about are <laughs> they, they don't they don't know what that is but most mm -hmm. kids will say yeah and i'm pretty guarded or and i'll say to them well you have to have your heart broken at least three times maybe seven times <laughs> and then you will be able to uh be in a relationship without uh, being controlled uh by by these dynamics that have to do with attraction rather than compatibility wow. and mo most of them kind of agree they agree mm -hmm. they had their heart broken and um moonfire magic's network bandwidth is low it says there uh, yeah, anyway we've got, go ahead, go we've, ahead. got we've got the um the blackout so it's all kind of whatever anyway um we are we are um we, we said we'd keep these two kind of uh, half an hour segments and we're almost at, well at the end of the first one so um i th i think my mind is already kind of in a in a great world from everything that you have said and i still feel like we're just we're not even scratching the surface. You, you, you've just got so much to share and so much to, to say. Um, so if you're happy, we will um, close this section, this segment, this wonderful half an hour of incredibly stimulating information. Um, I've got some classic, <laughs> classic, classic phrases and ideas, and then we can come back and um, carry on if that's okay with you. That's fine with me. That is lovely. Okay, well, thank you so much. It's been absolutely wonderful. And um, I really look forward to um, talking to you again, Bob. So uh, thank you for your time and your fantastic wisdom that can help everybody that hears it to understand themselves and their relationships and their kids. And um, we'll see you again soon. Okay. <laughs>